Welcome back to It's Haunted, What Now? I'm your host, Lainey. It's October, and we're officially in peak spooky times. The veil to the other side is getting thinner as the days wane down, and the apparitions grow restless. There's no hiding from the darkness, when the darkness begins taking more and more of what's left of the daylight. Burn a candle or turn on a light, because in this episode, we've curated a haunting bunch of stories that will have you shivering with unease and scratching at the tingle tickling up your spine. Okay, ready to get spooked? Pixel Paxi opens today's episode with what they've called the Kimono Girl. When I was growing up, I was living in a pretty rural area in western Washington, completely surrounded by woods in a little one-story house. My parents had picked the plot of land to build on about a year or two before I was born, and I was raised there for the first 11 years of my life. Starting when I was around three years old, I vividly remember that any time I had a sensation of my ears ringing, it was always an incredibly high pitch. I associated it with the sight of a little Japanese girl. I remember her red kimono with black patterns, gold lining, and her scraggly long black hair so clearly. Oddly enough, I don't even think I had ever seen a kimono at that point in my life. I didn't think much of it at the time. It was just the girl who makes the ringing sound when she opens her mouth. She would often be standing in the corner of whatever room I was in at the time, but always looking in my direction. That is, when she wasn't sobbing hysterically. She never felt threatening, so I never talked to my family about her. I was also an incredibly shy child, so I never tried to speak to her either. As I got older, she eventually stopped appearing when my ears rang. Later, when I was about 15 years old, I was looking into the theories about ghosts for fun and learned about the whole idea that when your ears start to ring for no reason, that means a ghost is trying to communicate with you. Upon reading that, I was met with the deepest chills I had ever experienced, and my eyes started streaming tears uncontrollably. I've always been skeptical of, yet fascinated by the paranormal, and that really hit me hard. I'm 30 now, have no signs of tinnitus, but still feel an overwhelming sense of unease and even sadness when I recall that little girl or tell the story to others. Has anyone else had these kinds of encounters as a young child? I'm very curious to hear of any similar accounts from others. Okay, so I get the ringing in my ears all the time and I always associated it with tinnitus for the amount of times I listened to really loud music when I was a teenager and probably still now. But the idea that a ghost is communicating with you or somebody on the other side is trying to communicate with you is speaking to my empath abilities probably and the fact that I block off any type of communication because no thank you. I'm going to be extremely suspicious of all instances of ringing in my ears now So thanks for this story and thanks for sharing that tidbit about ghosts trying to communicate because it wasn't something I'd ever heard before. It's not a surprise that something like this occurred to you at a young age since it's very known that children tend to feel and see more of the spiritual realm than adults do. Our next story is told by Froland445, who graced us in a previous episode about an encounter with friends in their basement workout room. This time, they bring us a more personal haunting. When I was 16, I'm 39 now, my stepdad died of lung cancer in the house I lived in. It was a very sad process as he did not want to die, never accepted his fate while he was alive. Towards the end, he was so high on meds, he didn't have any grasp on reality. The reason I mention that fact is I believe when he died, he didn't realize he was dead. 
now the happenings after his passing. My mom took a second job and I was home alone a lot. During this time, I would hang out in the basement most of the time. I would hear footsteps walking from their room to the kitchen and I would think my mom was home. I would head upstairs and nobody was there, but often cabinet doors would be open and or lights would be turned on that I knew were off. I had a very vivid dream where he was telling me about how much better he's feeling and how his hair is growing back, even on his feet. As I woke up from this dream, I was basically convulsing and making this very bizarre snorting noise. That's when I saw him walking out of my room. I had friends over for some drinking and card playing. I decided to go to sleep upstairs in my room and the three of my friends were sleeping in the basement. I was woken up by them in my room with them asking, How did you do that? I had no idea what they were talking about. They told me the basement lights were flickering and a radio turned on with song lyrics playing something along the lines of, This is my house. They were convinced I was playing some elaborate prank. I wasn't. The footsteps and cabinet door instances would continue and I became accustomed to hearing noises coming from their room where he died. Noises that sound like someone going through their things or just moving around. The last time I ever experienced anything from him was the strangest experience of all. I was home alone again, this time in the upstairs living room which was right by their bedroom. The bedroom door was open and I was on the couch watching TV. I started to think I heard something, so I muted the volume and listened. What I heard was very distinct and unmistakable breathing coming from the room. It was distressed and progressively getting louder. I yelled out, Okay, I hear you. I know you're here. Please stop haunting me. If you want to communicate, visit me in my dreams. The breathing immediately stopped and I just sunk as far into the couch as possible and try to continue to watch TV. Now, my mom really didn't know how to deal with his death. This was her soulmate, and she was completely destroyed. She started seeing a guy she worked with soon after, probably needing comfort or something I couldn't understand then. Whatever the case, he was over at the house spending time with her about a month after my stepdad's death. Whenever he was over, I could feel my stepdad's energy, and he wasn't happy. It's the best way I can describe it. Remember the night I heard the breathing, I told him to communicate with me in my dreams. I had a dream that night about my mom and her new boyfriend. They were hugging each other and then my stepdad came storming out of their room, chasing the guy out of the house. What I took away from that was that he didn't want my mom near this man. Come to find out, he was married and it ended up being a ridiculous situation. Since the night I told him to stop, I never experienced anything else in that house. My mother would see him where she worked often out of the corner of her eye, or she would smell him. One day, she called me freaking out saying, I saw him, I saw him. I turned the corner and he was there, standing in the aisle looking right at me. He still looked sick and very sad. She said he was a full-body apparition and was visible for about five seconds, long enough for her to say, I see you, I see you. This was the last time she or I had contact. That might have been the final goodbye. He was a great man. I miss him dearly. Well, thank you for sharing another story with us, even though it was on the more melancholy side. No matter how many years pass, it's still fresh in our hearts when we lose someone we truly cared about, no matter what role they played in our lives. And for me, that's how I often ask family members or loved ones and friends, whoever passes away, to visit me because I'm not open to seeing apparitions. I'd prefer to see them in my dreams and have communication there because I'm less afraid. But here at It's Haunted What Now, we want to send you our condolences to a man who cared about you in life and also in the hereafter. We're so glad that he was there to let you know about the sketchy guy in your mom's life and being able to show himself to her one final time. Our next story comes from My Wife Made Me Do This Too. Hmm, I don't know if we should be blaming her, but we'll see. They recount an odd collection of experiences 
that occurred during what was supposed to be a quiet early relationship weekend getaway. I sent this a while back, but have been thinking about the experience again, because it was so strange and I haven't gotten a satisfactory answer for what happened. I know I didn't imagine it, and I know it wasn't a dream. I find it frustrating when people suggest as much. I was talking to my wife today, and an experience we had came up, which we still can't explain. In February 2013, we were dating at the time, we decided to take a weekend trip to a resort on Lake Delavan in Wisconsin. The weather was cold, but not unusually so, and we thought it would be a neat getaway. To set the stage, the place was pretty much deserted when we arrived. It's mostly a summer attraction for families from Illinois to come and vacation. There's a beach where you can go swimming and also a nearby golf course. People also frequently use the resort for weddings, however, when we were there... There was a thick layer of snow on the resort grounds, and the lake was frozen over from months of sub-freezing temperatures. Not even Valentine's Day was enough to attract more than a handful of guests. We checked in and were directed to our room, which was about two-thirds of the way down a long, deserted hallway. The hallway had a line of rooms on the left side, which faced the lake. Walking to the room was kind of eerie because we passed an arcade that was completely deserted, and there were no signs of anyone else staying in that wing for the night. The hallway was completely empty and silent. When we arrived at the room, it seemed nice enough and had a pretty view of the frozen over lake. There was one bed adjacent to the wall nearest the bathroom, which was on the right side when you entered the room. We decided to go out and walk on the ice, as my wife was from a warmer climate and had never done so before. When we returned, the first strange thing happened. As I opened the door to our room, I realized I had left the light on. However, it abruptly turned off when we entered the room. It looked like one of those lights that had a timer and a motion sensor, so I dismissed it as a coincidence. The rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. We went to dinner at the resort restaurant and had a couple of glasses of wine. We were pretty tired, so we ended up going to bed early. I woke around 3 a.m. with an uneasy feeling. The room felt like someone turned the heat off. As I shook off the fogginess of sleep, I noticed a figure standing next to the bed. My hair stood on end as I tried to make out what it was. A woman with dark hair and a light-colored dress who was sort of glowing. Before I could make out any more detail, she dissipated. I dismissed this as a dream and eventually drifted back off to sleep. About an hour later, I awoke again with the same feeling. She was back. However, this time I was able to make out more detail. She appeared to be indigenous and had braided hair with a light-colored traditional dress. I did not get the sense she wanted to harm me. She eventually dissipated again without saying anything or really moving. As I lay in bed paralyzed by what I experienced, my wife abruptly sat up. Thinking she was awake, I said, Honey, are you up? But got no response. Her eyes were still closed and she laid back down again. Later, she would tell me that she did not have any memory of doing this. I did not go to sleep for a long time that night, but also did not experience anything else. The next morning, we woke up and were laying in bed talking. We hadn't been dating that long at the time and I was afraid of making her think I was crazy by telling her what had happened. Finally, I decided to do it and see if she remembered anything from the night before. As I recounted my story, the lights on the headboard above us flickered on and off. They were turned off at the time, so I found this to be very strange. Later that morning, we went into the bathroom and also noticed that the sink was on full blast. Neither of us recalled even using the sink that morning. We checked out that day and asked the hotel receptionist in passing whether or not the resort had any reports of being haunted. I expected them to laugh it off, but I instead got a very defensive vibe and denial from them. I later researched the lake and resort and found out that the grounds were home to indigenous burial mounds and were known to be haunted. I had no idea that this was the case before we went. 
I even found a post discussing how staff reported seeing a woman in a white dress who would wander the halls of the resort. Here at It's Haunted What Now, we would never discredit anything you saw. My go-to phrase, since I work in HR, is perspective is reality, right? The person's perspective is their reality, and I'm not here to negate somebody's reality. We believe you and wouldn't immediately chalk it up to dreaming, especially since the occurrences happen throughout your resort stay. I always advocate looking into the history of a place, and I'm glad to hear that's exactly what you did. Histories can give us a glimpse and idea of what may be happening. As for the receptionist acting defensive, sometimes locations don't want to be known as the haunted place and may deny activity so as not to hurt the business of the people who don't believe in the paranormal. Dylan, who is a medium, wraps up today's episode and shakes us all up with the worst experience of their life. Now, I've seen a lot of things, and this has shaken me to my core. Through the ages of 16 and 17, I was living with my Nana and Papa. Soon after I moved in, my cousin moved in with us. It was fall, and we were outside smoking, de-stressing from the day and getting ready for bed. To the left of us, about 100 feet away, was a small ravine or a stream that was at the bottom of a steep 8-foot slope. We were in the middle of a session when we heard footsteps coming through the water, up on the leaves and up to our side of the stream, but nothing was visible. I couldn't tell if it was good or bad, but we didn't stick around to find out because we booked it inside. After we went inside, we went upstairs. We lived in the basement, and so we had to go upstairs to get food. My cousin, we'll call her Sally, asked me to turn the light on in the living room so we could eat there. As soon as I passed the wall that separated the kitchen and living room, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a woman sitting in a frog pose staring at me. She had a ruffled up 80s hairdo and a white hospital patient outfit on, and she looked panicked. I ran back into the kitchen and told Sally what happened, and we walked into the living room, turned on the light, but the lady was gone. Later, as we're eating, I have a clear view through the kitchen in the back family room, and I see a white apparition of a male figure walking from a wall that not only leads outside, but is also the second story the house is built on a slope. This figure walks across the room to the wall that leads out to the balcony, the place right above where we were smoking an hour prior. Fast forward five months later, I had just moved back in with my mom, and one week later, I looked out my door at three o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom, and there she was that same woman from my Nana and Papa's living room on my mom's living room floor. It was the same spot on her stomach, her limbs bent and contorted in ways they shouldn't be able to. Her head was twisted backwards, her jaw was broken and open wider than it should have been, and no eyes. Her eyes were gone. It's something I can't unsee, but also something I can't fully describe. Okay, I don't have words for this experience. Seriously, all I keep thinking about is season four of Stranger Things with the time period and the state you saw that female apparition in. I don't even know what any of that was supposed to mean, what you were supposed to glean from it as a medium, but I'm also wondering what happened to that woman. And I don't really want to speculate at all because any theory would just be horrible to contemplate. Well, that does it for this episode. If you'd like to submit your own personal spooky tale to be read on the show, head to hauntedpod.com and click on the link to submit your story. You can also email me, hauntedpod at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on Twitter, for now, at podcast underscore haunted, Instagram at it's haunted what now or at hauntedpod.com. Production assistance by Jesse Hawk. Writing assistance by Sherilyn Reyes. The official composer and audio smith for the show is Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com. Until next time. 
Did you hear that? 